Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. November 3rd, 2020. Dars highlights. The creation of Adam, part 2. The Sheikh talked about this concept of as-salsal kal this baked clay, from which you make high-quality tagines in Morocco, called tagine slawi, tagine from the region of Sali, and you make majmars, which is a little clay stove, and the clay that's used to make these items has a plasticity in order for it to then be placed into the kiln overnight and the clay has to be exposed to heat in a balanced manner. It can't be too close to the fire or the heat of the kiln and it can't be too far from it. And similarly the salsal al is exposed to the radiations of the sun's light, the rays of the sun, and it remains alive. And what allows it to remain alive, or what denotes its living quality, is the fact that air flows through it. This uh, baked clay, it's porous. It allows for air to flow through it. And so if you have a clay cup and you pour water into it, the cup begins to sweat. And if you place seeds inside of it, they grow. And you too, as a human being, are a porous entity. And when you move, you begin to perspire, you begin to sweat. How many pores do you have on your skin? You can't count them. It's impossible. Take the eye alone, for instance. It's not just one cavity or one hole. Pupil, the single pupil, has countless pores or holes within it. And your bones are as well. They're porous as well. And if you take the human being and you enlarge him, you realize how grand the human being is. An ant could enter into him and come out if there's an enlarged figure of the human being. Each pore would be as big as, let's say, the hole inside of a donut. And the configuration of Sayyidina Adam, his existentiation, was such that when he was made, with God's hands, Iblis would come inside of him and out of him just as he wished. He would go into the skin or the hair or the nose, the nostrils, anywhere. He was like a maze and he wondered why was this created? All he saw was a labyrinth, the maze of the Adamic structure. You just see highways, but all mazes lead to a treasure. And what is the treasure? Of course, it's not dirhams. It's it's the nukta, the dot, the innermost secret, the sir, which rules over the maze. It's the ruh, the spirit. And you enter into this maze from anywhere, from the ears, the eyes, the skin. And the Prophet ﷺ says, O oh God, place light in my hearing and light on my tongue. He begins with the higher reaches, the higher regions of the maze of the human body. The mouth, the eyes, the ears. And then you apply that to the lower reaches as well. The upper higher realms of the human being, you have hearing, seeing and speech. Even though in reality your eyes and your skin themselves, they have eyes, hearing and speech. You are ears, eyes and tongues. You're an interconnected network. But you don't step back to see this configuration and maze that you are leading to this treasure. It's just like me right now looking at the screen of this iPad to give this dars. I don't see the lines and the networks. I just see a little screen in front of me. But it's a complex apparatus. The first computer that was created was massive. And then it was made smaller and smaller. Allah gives you the history of the human being. It was large as well. It's not that Allah didn't know how to make the human being small at first. Look at the computer. At first it was the size of a stadium. And now, mashallah, it's the size of a little tissue paper. And if the created creature can make such a thing, it's because he's the vicegerent of God even in his ability to create and innovate. 
in knowledge and in speech. A human being can speak of the Qur'an. And Allah says that when He first created Adam salam, He created him 70 cubits long, 70 forearms, the length of a forearm, vira', which equals 30 meters or 105 feet. And with a creature that big, you could probably stick your finger through each pore. And this grand creature learnt all the names and notes that his body was large and the Prophet والسلام, his body in comparison is smaller but the Prophet Sallallahu knowledge is greater than that of Adam even though in reality you can't compare Sayyidina Adam and, and Rasulullah because Rasulullah has no, out, he has no counterpart or method and he says I was a prophet while Adam was between clay and water that is, I am Adam and Musa and Isa alayhim salam and now Mustafa sallam, appears but he flows through them in his inner reality. Inwardly, the reality of the Prophet is unattainable and unsurpassable. He is the furthest boundary, the muntaha. And what is the furthest boundary for Adam salam, is the beginning uh, for the Prophet والسلام, Adam is, uh, occupies the first heaven and the Prophet وسلم, begins there his night journey of ascent through the heavens and that journey is therefore made possible for the Ummah by virtue of the Prophet والسلام, and by virtue of the verse when the sky splits forth and is the color of a rose and there's verses If you're able to pierce through the heavens and the earth and you can with God's permission and that of the Prophet and this is quality, a characteristic for the Ummah of Al-Mustafa He wasn't allowed for the previous Prophets hence the Prophet says the scholars of my nation are like the Prophets of the children of Israel so there's a counterpart or a correspondence, as we've said, between the earth and the human being. And we've said that the body of the human being, has, of the children of Adam, has shrunk outwardly. And that inwardly, the Messenger, والسلام, his knowledge is grander. And that that of his ummah, that his ummah also has access to greater knowledge as well. Nowadays, the human being is smaller upon the earth, and the earth itself has become smaller as well. Someone can take four flights to attend the Mawlid. Others perform Umrah in a single day. They're back by the evening. In, in times of old, you needed an entire year to go and come back. And so, just as the human being has decreased in size, the earth too has become smaller, but the realm of the spirit is grand. Note that the nation of Al-Mustafa والسلام, produces awliya of the caliber of Rabi al adawiyah who says, O oh Allah, if I worship you for the garden, deprive me of the garden. And if I worship you out of fear of hell, cast me in hell. Rabi'ah is saying that she does not wish to stop or halt with any heaven. She is seeking the absolute, non-delimitation. Her inwardly, there's a vastness, and outwardly, she's small, like a dot. Now the human being wants to live on Mars. Earth itself has become too small for him, as if it's something worthless. You have businessmen running businesses on seven continents as if they're rulers of the earth, astaghfirullah. The point being that the body has shrunk and the ruh has become wide or increased and enlarged. For travelers on the path, alhamdulillah, this is a blessing from God, meaning that the thronehood, al-arshiyya, is accessible, it's available. The problem is that most humans do not use this opportunity to please their Lord, save for a few upon whom God has mercy. In our time, in theory, in principle, this arshiyah, 
thronehood or access to the quality of the divine throne or centeredness is accessible but in practice it's not open to just anyone because it needs this rectitude at the bodily level with the balance of an Adamic creature. But few have the balance of Sayyidina Adam. Sayyidina Adam roamed the seven continents when he descended to the earth. Each continent was like a bedroom for him. The earth was like his home. You, on the other hand, you're unable to live in all these different types of climates. Let's say you couldn't live in South Africa and the North Pole. You need regions that complement your bodily configuration. You you don't have the Adamic i'tidal or Adamic balance to be able to find comfort and roam through every landscape. But in short, the point of all this of this entire maze that the human being is is to worship God. And the people of taste say that it's to know God. And the Prophet ﷺ describes himself as a city of Ma'rifah. And Ali is its door. So if you want to find the door to exit this maze, to escape the darkness of your lower self, you need to search for the door of Sayyiduna Ali, which is bequeathed by those whom God wants to inherit this treasure. The treasure of the heart, of a sound heart. The treasure of love of Al-Mustafa and Ahlul Bayt and Al-Kitab. If you have this love, then any pore that you enter through will lead you to the cardiac reality or the haqiqa qalbiya, the reality of the heart, of the maze. And what do you find within this reality or this treasure, you find divine knowledge or ma'rifa. The problem is, where can we find a murid who surrenders his or her affair and is able to draw and take this ma'rifa? We have murids who turn away from their own hearts and open the books of others. You cannot enter the heart except if it's sound. And you enter this state of soundness of heart with or by virtue of the sirru nukta, the secret of the dot, which exercises control over all the spring sources or the fountainheads and pores, you could say, of your maze of the human body. Once you enter into that secret of the dot, the arshiya, this control of the throne begins and now you begin to study the arshiya of the city and you apply that to your entire body. You apply this inner arshiya on your outer limbs. The journey goes now back from the heart to the outer limbs. And the Prophet says really he's saying that if you don't have this, you're not in this state that you're not really praying. He says, Ya Allah, place nur in all my directions, on all your limbs. And so you see this dua of the nur that he makes on the way to the prayer contains teaching or summary of the entire path. You can never exhaust these hadiths, but if you feel bored of the durus, it's because you belittle the hadith in your heart. You think, oh, the shaykh is going to repeat the same hadith over and over. The Qur'an has an outward aspect, an inner aspect, a limit and a place of ascent. ظاهر باطن حد المطلع And the hadith too, it has an outward, inward and a place of ascent and a borderline because the hadith explains the Qur'an. Even exoteric scholars cannot exhaust the hadith exoterically. And the same applies esoterically or for the inner meanings of the hadith. What's the boundary of the Qur'an? There is none. What's the place of ascent, al-matla, of the Qur'an? There is none. These are openings onto the infinite. But when you hear the same hadith, you just turn off the phone and go to bed and you say, oh, this, bo- this dust is kind of boring. At that moment, you should know that your heart 
has slept, you've turned off the phone and your heart at the same time. Then Sheikh goes back to the to explaining the configuration of Adam and he says that you're a maze, a labyrinth. And we've spoken a bit about the pores and the skin and the clay. And one day we'll speak of the fat and the flesh and the bones. We've also spoken of the tailbone, Ajabu Dhanab, which is the element within you that doesn't decay. It's what remains in the grave. It's at the bottom of the spine. And it's the last element. So you know what the last element is. Now you have to search for the first one. And as you search for that original first one, you have to define your search through the proofs of the book and the sunnah. So that there's no wiggle room for you or for whoever you speak to. You need the outward you need the inward, the point of ascent. You need it all. I swear, wallahi, you don't know your nafs. How can you display it or manifest it or hide it or ascend through it or define it? You're a closed envelope. If you read your letter, you would know how to take hold of your book. But you've given your back to it. When will you take your book? When will, will you hold it? You will do so when you face your Lord. And you say, my heart spoke to me about my Lord. And I, I say, try to witness the nur on the right and on the left and in front of you and behind you and above and below. In order to make your turning, your directionality towards God firm, your wijha. If you don't see the nur before you, you're still looking for your qibla. It's like if you're lost in the desert... You can pray in any direction, east, west, north, or south. But if you know the Qibla, then you can turn towards it even in the middle of the prayer. And an ignorant person who's praying, not knowing what the Qibla is, if you turn them in the middle of the prayer, they'll push you away. But a person of knowledge who's looking for the Qibla will allow another person to turn them toward the Qibla they're flexible, they have plasticity and malleability. They are salsal, they're clay, malleable clay. And you can turn them in the direction of the Qibla in the middle of their prayer. May Allah bless us with a Qibla of Al-Mustafa salam and with a luminosity by which we return to our Lord, that we may fall in prostration to Allah so that the Nur may be our intercessor that we may cross the bridge of guidance with no reckoning. And may Allah Ta'ala bless us with joy in our rebirth of knowledge of Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu salam. Uh, and I, I would just also note as a, a final uh, remark, there was a, a faqir who was sitting close to the shaykh on the left during the dars. And it, it was a cold day and so he he had to move and the sheikh said what are you doing and the window was open and he seemed uncomfortable the sheikh said oh that's fine you can go sit further from the window so that you're not uncomfortable but we're going to draw you near as the dars goes on and the sheikh smiled and then as the dars went on towards the end the murid indeed was actually sitting to the sheikh's right and the sheikh commented he said you see this is what we do in the path is that we we, we we draw the faqir closer and closer inch by inch. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad kama barik ta'ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala ala Sayyidina Ibrahim fil alamina inna